ask some questions. On all the things that we have spoken about, are the questions that you have, are the things that you would still like for us to address. So we are at the halfway mark now for the camp. We've got another six sessions to go. But I would like to know where we are now. Are there any burning questions you want us to address? Are there any issues in particular that you would like us to address around this issue of the revelation of the sons and daughters of God? I know some of you have interacted with me one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm happy to do it also in the group session. So here you go. Here's your opportunity if you are here. Uh, okay, so I've noted you, number one, number two. Okay, let's start with you. Good morning, No, no, you don't need to. So now, but it's part of yes. identifying my gift. Yes. But, <coughs> but you don't need for them to affirm you. Yeah. It's just that when you, are, when you are so good at the area of your gifting, yeah. generally people will affirm that they are also in money. Mm. But you don't need their affirmation. Say again. Mm. You don't need their affirmation. You don't need it. But chances are if you are good at your gift, they will. But it's not something that you need, you know. You, must, you, you mustn't rely on people to fulfill the work of God in your life. Because more often than not, people will tell you something that you mustn't do this thing. When you know inside of you, God has called you to do that. Okay, number two. Hi, everyone, again. Um, so my question, I think I have two, but the first one is, say, um, you're a type one worker and you're solving problems, you're proactive about your work. How do you deal with someone who is in the, it doesn't even have to be a workspace, just a space where your leader or your superior in that sense is not as proactive as you or not as type one. And so they perceive your type one-ness as being insubordinate. Yeah, mm -hmm. like that. And then the second one was, you are the leader in this case. And unfortunately, the work is not, um, it's not type one level. You need other people as well. But there are a few team members or there are a few um, workers who are not pulling the weight. Uh, how do you manage those two situations? So how do you help them to get to number one or... How do you still, how do you get them to number one, or how do you still manage to complete the task as a team with type fours in the, in the team? You know, the, maybe let's just to start with the second one. One of the reasons why certain people thrive, or people thrive, is because, because others aren't prepared to work. Am I making sense? So, you know, Jesus says something which we might not like. Um, but when someone ministers to him and other people are complaining, he says to them, the poor you will always have with you. He makes that statement. He says, the poor you will always have with you, but I'm here for only for a season. Let this woman bless me the way she wants. Mm -hmm. Now, and the reason why they will always have the poor is because no matter how hard you preach, not everyone will act on the message of what has been preached. Mm. And therefore, the few that take the message and run with it, those are the ones that succeed in life. Yeah. And therefore, as much as I would like for there, when we leave here, that all of us are number ones, I'm realistic enough to know that not everyone will accept that message. I mean, even when Jesus, the King of Kings, preached and did not accept his message, who am I? Mm -hmm. To think that I can preach and everyone will be converted. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that. You have to accept. In life, people will respond and others won't respond. So in fact, if anything, you know, you, you can talk to people. And now I always say, the more lazy people we have, the better the opportunities for me. Maybe you can say that's a bad thing. Maybe you can say it's a selfish thing. The more lazy you are, the more I'll thrive in life. 
What was your first question, man? How do you feel like a superior who is not type one and this is type one? So it's a it's not an easy one. Because um, you could in a sense uh, be seen as if you're trying to outshine them in the first place. Um, and that's why I said, number one, sometimes you almost have to hold them back. Because not all the decisions you'll make as a number one will be right. So some of them will be wrong, and they might, you know, end you in a, in a spot of God. You might be in a, in a place where you're in trouble. So here's my advice. So on things that you know that need to be solved, so in other words, we've agreed that these are the problems and they need, they need to be solved. You just, so let me make an example. If you work in a restaurant and you see that the bin is full, I don't care whether the manager is going to say I'm chacha or not. I know that's something that needs to be done. You just do it. I mean, there's no way that he's going to call a disciplinary hearing for you because you took out the trash. There's no way he's going to do a disciplinary hearing for you because when you saw that the, the table where the people were eating is looking filthy. You go and you sort it out. There's no way. But when it's new things, when you identify a new problem and you know that you've got a superior like that, I think sometimes it's good to bring them in, in, in your confidence. So I work a lot with politicians in my space. And one of, one of the things that I, I tell myself, one of my jobs is to make them look good. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do my job so that they get the shine. And I'm fulfilled in what I'm doing. I get paid for what I'm doing. But he thinks, you know, he preaches to the world, we've built these roads, we've done all of this, and he, he, you know, he gets all the points and all the glory. Meanwhile, I got paid. And I'm happy that I got paid. And so they come back to us time and time again because we make them look good. And I think if you can bring them into confidence like that, so that they don't think that you're trying to outshine them, I think over time, you should win them more. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, she says she, her voice is uh, gone, so she needs to whisper in my ear.
still your attention. Uh, I'm going to try and summarize the question. Eh? So the question goes around. Um, um, so uh, apparently there was a, a podcast that uh, they were watching where it involved a certain Sangoma. Um, and apparently she related a story where one of the kids was sick and was taken to the hospital and was in ICU, etc. And I think, I think that the long, the, the, to summarize the story, I think what she was saying was that she got well after the African traditional medicine intervened or something like that. And therefore she was asking whether was it her choice uh, to choose to go that way, or was it a, 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 a predetermined choice, something like that? I think that, I don't know if the question makes sense, but that's what she is essentially asking. So, I'm a firm believer that all of us have a choice. Mm -hmm. All of us have a choice. And an independent choice at that. Independent from God, independent from our parents, we always have a choice. And also, I think the question was also tailored around some young people here might be struggling with a case where you are in this space as a Christian, but you're coming from a family that still believes in African traditional beliefs, and therefore, what do you do in that kind of a space? Um, it, needs some, it needs some time, but maybe a short answer to your question is, I always say that you know the Bible in the Old Testament, during Saul's time, it talks about Saul, when he became a king, he abolished everyone with the spirit of divinity who could consult with the dead, when he became king. But later on, after God was unhappy with him, there was a time when he was about to go to war, and the prophet was not coming, and he wanted direction from the Lord. And he said, no, let us go to someone with the, who can connect with the spirits of the dead. And they went to this particular lady. And when they, they consulted with this lady, this lady was able to interact with the dead prophet of God. You know that story yeah. in the Bible? Yeah. And the reason why I'm saying this is, is again to say when people people tell these things are not there, these things are liberated, when they, in fact they are there in the Bible. The Bible tells us these things are there. But here's the problem. And there's a reason why God says he doesn't want you to interact with these spirits. I like what Baba um, Babu Kumi always says about the issue of ancestors. He says everything that's got to do with ancestors is always looking down. Our pants. Everything you do, you have a pants. Why would you not rather go up? Why would you want to go down? The problem with linking yourself with ancestral spirits and spirits of the dead, in fact, if you read that very passage about soil, I remember when I was teaching in another church, I was talking, I was actually talking to them about the importance of spiritual connections. How important it is that you connect with the right people spiritually. Because I said to them, whatever you connect to, you are connected to the thing that that thing is connected to. And I always use the example of a plug here. When you connect to that socket there, I'm not just connecting to that circuit, but I'm connecting to what that circuit is connected to. Are we together? So that connection, that circuit is connected probably to a substation somewhere here. So when I plug here, I'm connected to a wire that is connected to a substation. But that substation is connected to pylons. So in my mind, I'm thinking that I'm only connecting to a socket here, but that's not true. I'm connecting to the cable that is connected to the substation, that is connected to the pylons. And not only am I connected to the pylons, but I'm connected to the source, which is the power station. So every time you connect with these spirits of the dead, you're actually connecting with death itself. 
And that is why as soon as King Saul had made that connection with the dead, there was a pronouncement that in this battle you will die. Because he had connected himself with the spirits of the dead. So you have a choice. You can choose, I'm going to do things with those that are down. But I choose to do all my things with the ones that are up there. They, they, they want, sometimes they want to argue with us that we are also worshipping the dead. Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. Jesus is not an ancestor. He is alive. They touched him. They put, his, they put their fingers on his, where he was pierced. On his side, on his hands, he is alive. So you have a choice. So if you find yourself in that predicament, you have a choice. You always have a choice. And my advice to you is choose God. Amen. Some more questions? Yes, sir. a good question and um, I so it, it, it really relates and I, I presume you're talking about a relationship with a view of getting a potential spouse yes. yeah. so how do you know that your intention is going to be there okay. um, so here's something that uh, my spiritual father taught us when we youth. I subscribe by it I teach it to all other young people mm -hmm. because I think it's a good thing and here's how it goes and I think you must, you must always differentiate when I'm giving you my opinion and when I'm giving you God's word. So what I'm giving you now is my spiritual father's opinion, which I also care. So I share the same opinion as him. So what he taught us is that when you, are, when you feel that you are ready to get into a relationship, the first thing is you must assess whether you are ready to get married. So that's the first thing. You must assess whether you are ready to get married. It doesn't mean that when you get into a relationship with a lady, you'll end up marrying her. But that must be your end goal. Yes. So that's the first starting point. It mustn't be a case of putting, I'm getting into a relationship just in jail. Because that's where the problem starts. Yes. Yes. And I remember guys were arguing about, with me about it. And I said, guys, I'm not saying that the first lady that you go out with, I'm not saying marry them. But I'm saying that's where your intentions must be as a brother. Yes. Yeah. You must have the intention of eventually marrying when you get it. So that's the first thing that you must do. <laughs> and then the second thing, in other words, that's why I don't recommend people to be in relationships when they're in their teens. You know, I don't like, because you're not ready to get married when you're in your teens. You, know? you must be at a point where if this thing works out in a few months, years, you get married. So, Mena, when I was in, in university, when I was in final year, I already knew who I wanted to marry. My mind was set up, this is the one. That one, she's the one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, when, when you're in a space where you realize, if I, if I don't act here, I'm going to lose out. That's how I felt with my wife. I felt I have to do this. And I, I promise you, the year I graduated, yeah. in June, I sent delegation to a home. <laughs> September, we finished. In December, we got married in one year. Here's the thing, and, and, and the reason why I encourage you to do it and to do it quickly. Here's, here's some pearls of wisdom for someone who, who, who is prepared to listen. So here's something I learned from one of my cousins. I won't take the word for it. He was much older than I was. 
And he said something to me as a young man that stuck with me. He said to me, the longer you stay in a relationship with a lady without marrying them, the more you will realize she's not the right one for you. You know why? You know why? Because no one is perfect. The longer you stay with them, the more the faults will come out, the more the inconsistencies will come out and you'll think she's not the one. You'll go to another one, you'll, you'll think she's okay. You stay with them, you pick up. So when you find someone where you've got common things, as you say, as you say, Number two, what our spiritual father taught us is that don't go to the lady that you feel attracted to and tell her. He said to us, first study her without her knowing. Space where you may let's say you go to the same church, you can see how serious she is about the things of God. You can see whether you know how does she react to a mom. So when we go to her home for a cell meeting, how does she treat all of those things? You're checking, you're checking her out without her knowing that you're checking her out. And only when you figured out that I think, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to eliminate this thing where brothers go into multiple relationships before they get married. Especially in the same church setting. You go out with this lady, next thing you go out with that one, next thing you go out with, it's a problem. Yeah. So my spiritual father was actually trying to avoid that situation. So that's the second thing. And then he said, once you are ready, you come and tell us, as your elders, that now you want to start dating. And he said, the simple reason why you tell us is so that we know, and we can protect you. But at the same time, we want to protect these young ladies. So that if you're the kind of guy that always changes their mind, we won't have to stop you. Because you can't keep on coming to us every year and say, so next year, send one, we come away. We stop you and we say, no, no, no. Because we need to protect our daughter. Are you with me? So, for me, if you have done those steps, in other words, you've said, okay, I'm ready. Number two, I've started here. Because at the same time, you also don't want to hurt her if, it end, if she ends up being not the one. So rather I have eliminated a lot of the negatives first yeah. without her knowing. Yeah. Then you're going there with good intentions yeah. when you approach her. So that's what I would advise. Wow. Once you look at the world, once you look at the world, you look at the world, you look at the world, and you look at the world. See, 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 see. And I've got no answer. And hence I'm saying, me now I realize with my wife, what if I don't? Some brother will come. Mm -hmm. So hence I said, no, I need to push. Because, I mean, you know when you go to, uh, you go to like settings like this, uh, you can see with the, they're all after this lady. They all have an interest. So I realize with the, I need to move. <laughs> So it, it can happen. It can happen. Yeah. But I'd rather you do it right. Rather you rush for it, yeah. and then you can have everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, so Christian, but their family still practices um, those rituals or whatever they may be. 
So how do that individual that chose to be like Christian, how do they deal with it? How should they deal with it actually? Okay. Yeah. So another way I see it is it's it's one of the gifts. It's a gift. It's a gift of prophecy more than anything. That's what it is. And I think it needs to be nature such that it can benefit the church instead of us chasing those people away. The way that you do it is just that you do it in a Christian way without having to consult the deity. And typically, what, what happens with most of these people is they, they, they dream a lot. <coughs> they get a lot of dreams, and, they, and that's how they get their visions. And there's a verse I want us to look at very quickly in the book of Job, chapter 33, verse 15. Job 33, verse 15. Job, Job. <laughs> Tell me once you found it. Job 33, verse 15. Okay, let me have you found it. Yes, no? Yes. Okay. So it reads as such, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, when slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. So this is God talking to people in dreams. Are you with me, Brother Oscar? Yes. In fact, just want to see that I've, there's another verse I'm looking, I'm looking for you. Let me just try to find it. If you read from verse 14, it says, For God may speak to one, may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, while slumbering on their beds. So who's speaking to men? It's God who's speaking to men and who's speaking through them in vision. The problem is they don't know how to deal with it. And then they go and seek answers through ancestors. So hence I'm saying all that we need to do, this is a gift from God. And more people are more, certain people have got a pronounced way of hearing from God through dreams than others. And all that we need to do is to show them that this thing is in the scripture, and that they, if, if anything, they've got a prophetic calling, and they must come and use it in the kingdom of God. Instead of looking down, look up. There's another question also. Uh, uh, yes, sorry, sir. Uh, what about five minutes before you talk to us? Um, Fundi, so back to what you said on you didn't say as quickly as possible, but I feel like, so you meet someone and then you, said, you see their flaws the longer you are with the person. So our, like song is now one, two. we all make mistakes, we all sin, we all sin, so on and so forth. But what I'm trying to understand is what stops you from seeing those errors when you are in life? What stops you from seeing them? Yeah. Or to them? deal with them. You do see them, but... So, how is it that when you are in marriage, you can deal with them? When you're not, you can't. Well, I, I, I'd say it this way. And the reason why I say do it before is once you marry, you know, so there's certain things that we think we can stomach and certain things that we think... You know. And so... When you allow yourself to study here unknown, at least you are, you are able to eliminate those things that will eventually frustrate you when you are married. Because, make no mistake, there is, there is nothing called a perfect marriage. Nothing like that exists in the entire world. We are all working on our marriages. Because we are all human and we've all got flaws. We love one another, we are committed to one another. Hey, but sometimes they are.
So I mean, all I'm doing is I'm just protecting you from having to deal with some of those things at the later stage. Because if you see them, you haven't spoken to her, she's not going to be hurt because she doesn't know. So I'm never going to because you never told her anything. It protects both of you. Because what if you find out she's got something that is so difficult for you to deal with, but now you are locked in marriage. And for us as Christians, we believe that tatile tati. So it's really a protection for you and for her for that matter. That's how I see it. Uh, okay, let's go there first and then I'll continue. you. Joseph who was a dreamer. He is what people would call his woman today. Joseph was a type of man. He could see things. He could see into the future. But even with him or someone like Daniel for that matter, when it was time for an interpretation, they, they clearly say it is for God to interpret dreams. So they go back to the one who can interpret dreams and they ask him to help them because you don't give yourself dreams. Therefore you can't give yourself the interpretation. So you go back to the one that gave the dream and say, Lord, you interpret this. If it doesn't interpret it, it's not your problem because you didn't give yourself the dream in the first place. Mm. That's how I see it. So you mustn't worry about being gifted in things that you won't be able to fulfill. You will always be able to fulfill them. I mean, I thought what you were saying, Wuti Mklambe, you've got a gift and you realize, Wuti, it's not really something that, you know, you want to entertain. So for example, with, um, with some people who are called into ministry, into the fivefold ministry. Example of me, I didn't want to be a speaking gift. I did not want from foolies. That was the last thing I wanted in my life. Last thing. That was the last thing I wanted in my life. <laughs> but, you know, the more... So I was, I was quite active at church. And obviously, Ubaba uh, and Pansiwa, you get opportunities uh, to first of all be an MC at church. And then the next thing, when there's a cell meeting, they ask you to share a word. And the next thing, Mark, when we have to take an offering, he calls the you to take the offering. And so you go. And then the next thing, he says, come and share the word on the pulpit. And you say, it doesn't fool, it's not fine when you bring the food. But the more I did that, God started to show me, Uti, every time I was given an opportunity to speak, 
people would tell me how much of an impact they were had on their lives. Yeah. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said to me, if you can see that what God has given you is able to help other people, how can you be so selfish to make it about yourself? Mm -hmm. So, not my will, Lord, but your will. So in my case, it was a case of, let me submit to your will. And funny enough, the more I got into it, the more I started to fall in love with the gifting. And I mean, you, you'll be surprised, but every time I have to come up on stage, my heart still pumps. Eh? My heart still pounds. I'm not a, I'm not a natural speaker, I mean. But because God says you must do it, I don't say God is not something that, ish, because you say so far, you equip me with all the things I need to fulfill the gift and the purpose that you have given me. I don't know if I've answered your question. Okay. Thank you. Some more? Yes, oh yes. Uh, I've noted you, my guy. Um, so, in relation to the <coughs> gifting, right? So, I've heard some people say, Uti, the gift comes without repentance and whatnot, and, and sometimes it can be tainted through the whole ancestral uh, worship and all of that. So, my issue is sometimes because people have the gift, whether they are on a day or not, and all that, um, how people can approach you. I've been approached before by people to say, God told me to tell you, wara, 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 right? So my first thing is, how do I validate that? Is this what you really want to say? Or are you just trying to play with me? And then secondly, for people who have the gift, like the dreams, for example, right? Um, you can dream about something, say it's a, maybe a vision of something that's going to come. How do I differentiate between, is this a dream for God or is this just a dream? Because I've had dreams about camp already and so many yeah. You know, yeah. we'll say, oh, I know, I'm singing yeah. silent night or whatever. <laughs> but it, is this the influence of what's <coughs> happening right now or is this actually from God? Sure. Okay. All right. So, um, when, when it comes to dreams, because I think your question really revolves around dreams and dreams. Um, here's my piece of advice. Um, so how do you react to dreams? Um, first of all, in line with the scripture that we read, where it says, you know, in one way or the other, God speaks to men, it's just that they don't perceive it, in a dream, in a vision. So God could be speaking to you through a dream, through a vision, in the night. So the first thing I would recommend when you get a dream, the first thing, write it down. Write down what you can. Put it in your iPad or whatever, your, your cell phone, record it. Because how many times have you had a dream and then when you wake up in the morning you forgot? You know, I mean, I had this dream but I forgot what I was dreaming of. So record them. Write them down. That's the first thing. And then what I always say with dreams and interpretations, I always say to people, whenever you dream about the familiar, there's a good chance that it may not necessarily be something significant. So let me use an example. If I dream about my son and my wife and my neighbor, it's probably, it's probably in my mind just replaying what happened or something, I don't know. But every time I dream of someone I've never seen before, and they speak in a voice I've never heard before, or I'm in a place I've never been before, that's, a, that's always a sign that it could be more than just your memory or your mind. So in terms of how, whether you take dreams seriously or not, mm -hmm. if it's something that's completely unfamiliar, then it's probably from the spirit world. Now whether it's the spirit of God or the spirit of, of the dark world, I can't tell. But I'm just saying, if it's something unfamiliar, that's the first thing that you must use. And then you must refrain from, so there's these websites where you can go and they tell you, if you are a parent, this is what it means. You know, if you dreamt of a, someone doing this, that's all nonsense. 
avoid this notion of using a single thing to interpret the dream. And the reason why I said it, I think there's a scripture, the book of Genesis. Genesis, I think it's probably chapter 40. When Joseph was interpreting the dreams, uh -huh. right, chapter 40, let's read from verse 9. Let me read from verse 3 very quick. Genesis chapter 40, from verse 3. Uh, it says, So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, so they were in custody for a while. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream, both of them, each man's dream in one night, and each man's dream in his own interpretation. And Joseph came in to them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. So he looked at Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of his Lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, We each had a dream, and there is no interpreter for it. So Joseph said to them, do interpretations, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. So you can see already, Joseph is telling them that I'm not the interpreter, but God is the interpreter. And then verse 9, the butler tells his dream. He said the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, Behold, in my dream a vine was before me, and, the vine, and in the vine were three branches. It was as though... It budded, its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and presented them into Pharaoh's cup, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, there is the interpretation of the dream. So he says to him, the three branches are the three days. So this guy dreams about branches, and the branches represent what? They represent days. So a branch represents days. Okay. And then he interprets this guy's dream and he tells him Pharaoh is going to restore you and you're going to go back. So in three days' time, Pharaoh is going to come down here, he's going to restore you to your position. So when this other guy heard that this guy had a favorable interpretation, he said, Hey Nama interpret, I'm prophet Namda. Because he hears that it's a positive interpretation. Okay? So when you read verse 14. No, verse 16. It says, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream, and there were three white baskets in my head. And then he explains what happens. He explains what happens in the dream. And then when Joseph interprets in verse 18, it says, so Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. So the three baskets are what? So branches in dream interpretation can represent days, but a basket can also represent days. So don't go with this nonsense where they tell you that one particular thing represents this. Different things can, dif can represent different things when it comes to dreams. So what I'm trying to say to you is number one, write it down. Number two, ask God for the interpretation. Number three, don't go with standard interpretations. Because if you see how people interpreted dreams in the Bible, you will see that each time there was an interpretation, it was different. Number three, make sure that it aligns with scripture. Mm -hmm. Especially when it, when it comes to um, you know, someone's life and when you're telling them about their destiny. There can't be an interpretation that says God told you you must be a son of <laughs> That can be God who's telling you to interpret that. So that's what I would, um, you know, I, I basically advise. I don't know if I've answered your question. 
And then I think there was another question there. Juniper. Okay. They said that food would be ready only at two, so. you speak to Christians and you ask them about things, usually they answer you on the basis of their own opinions or beliefs. Remember I said that earlier. And I think my response to you, Junior, is that I don't think, I don't think you disagree with me. I think you disagree with the word. Because everything that I'm saying about the ancestral worship is something that I get from scripture. Remember I said the certain things where my opinion doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. My opinion doesn't matter in this, in this thing. I use the word of God as a basis for the things that I'm saying here. So if you've got scriptures that can show us this maybe that we've missed, let's engage with one another. But I think it's a problem where we're going to say to one another, no, this is the situation because it's what I believe, mm -hmm. but we can't prove it in the word of God. So hence I say, I don't think me and you have a disagreement. But maybe you have a disagreement with the word of God. That's, that's maybe what I would say. Because God clearly says he doesn't want his children. He only wants them to have one God, have one person, one mediator. There's only one mediator between God and man, and it's Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. That's where I take my opinions from. And honestly, that's the only answer I can give as far as that one is concerned. Amen. Amen. Any more? Yes, at the back there. 